blindsided, effing amateur hour, totally screwed up and blindsided. That's just some of the language that the Democrats are using, saying that Joe Biden really dropped the ball on this one. We've got some headlines from Slate saying, why Biden stabbed DC in the back? Well, that doesn't sound good. This guy says that the White House F this up royally. Almost said it that time. Effing amateur hour. Almost, you know, got to be careful here on this program. But we're going to go through it because Biden actually posted something on Twitter saying that he is kind of overriding D.C. D.C. wanted to pass this crime bill and the crime bill was going to do some things in D.C., like lower penalties for carjackings and other things. And so here's what he posted on Twitter. He said, look, relax, everybody. I support D.C. statehood and home rule. However, I don't support some of the changes that the D.C. council put forward over the mayor's objections, like lowering penalties for carjacking. If the Senate votes to overturn what D.C. did, he said, I'll sign it. Okay, so that means basically he's siding with the Republicans. If the if the bureaucrats in Washington and the Republicans take this power away from Washington, D.C., Biden's going to support that. He's going to side with the Republicans. What? All right. So the Democrats are very unhappy about this. And The Hill gave us a good article and they tell us House Democrats feel like they've been blindsided, blindsided, very dramatic, as Biden changes tune on the D.C. crime bill. Let's take a look at what the article tells us. This was written by Al Weaver and Michael Schnell, March 2nd. They say House Democrats were infuriated and taken aback by President Biden's announcement on Thursday that he's going to sign a resolution to nix the D.C. crime bill. The crime bill in D.C. has come under heavy criticism from Republicans and some centrist Democrats. But last month, 173 House Democrats, like AOC, voted along with what they thought was the White House's stance, that Biden would veto the resolution in an attempt to stand up for the district's home rule. Right, Biden's been saying that Washington, D.C. should be the 51st state. Of course, Democrats want that. It votes like 99% Democrat. Maybe a little bit less than that, sorry. But the prop, the point is, it would be another three electoral votes for them. They'd get another two senators, another, I think, three representatives. And that would tip the balance of power of all the elections indefinitely in their favor eternally. They're loving this. They're like, perfect, that's exactly what we need. Now, critics of this say, well, you know, there are certain things in the Constitution that you have to follow. And, you know, we have a sort of a district set up there. And there's also this idea that maybe D.C. is a little bit too powerful, a little bit too much concentrated wealth and lobbyist and all of this stuff. There are some people, yours truly included, who think it might be a good idea to sort of disband DC, right? Make it a ceremonial, historical location. But all of this stuff is sort of, you know, dissipated and decentralized back around the country so that all of the nefarious characters can't just coalesce and collude with each other in their disgusting halls around, you know, the basements of Congress. So instead, Biden made the revelation to Senate Democrats during a lunch on Thursday. He's like, oh, yeah, by the way. And he angered the colleagues. Now, like he's like, they're really, really angry. Right. I'm not overstating this. Here's what they said via text message. One House Democrat sent a text message to the Hill, this entity right here. They said the White House effed this up royally. And they even had to you know, asterisk out the F word here. Noting that the White House issued a statement of administration, the, the statement of administration policy. So you're going to hear these in uh, Corrine's testimony. She talks about SAPs, right? The statement of administration policy, the SAPs, opposing the resolution and backing D.C. And that they were prepared. House Democrat told leader, House Democrat leadership told lawmakers that Biden was going to veto what the Republicans were doing. Right. The Republicans were going to pass this. They're in control of the House. There were a couple of defectors in the Senate. And so anyways, he was going to nuke this. Now he's not. So the declaration from OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, called on Congress to respect the District of Columbia's autonomy to govern itself and govern its own affairs. Right. D.C. says, hey, you know, we're we're our own society here and we want to govern ourselves. And, I, you know, I definitely don't want the federal government governing me. So I can relate to their uh plight there, but they're living in DC and there's, you know, certain, there's there's certain reasons why it's a district and not a state. So a lot of us who are allies, one lawmaker continued, this lawmaker is, this is a lawmaker who's dropping these F-bombs to the Hill. Okay. One Democrat told the Hill, one house Democrat. So this is a Congressperson. The White House F this up royally. 
He goes on, he continues. He says, so a lot of us who are allies voted no in order to support what the White House wanted. We voted this way to support Biden. And now we are being hung out to dry, he said, or she. The lawmaker continued, quote, effing amateur hour, effing amateur hour. Heads should roll over at the White House over this. The House Democrat added multiple other lawmakers were, quote, extremely capitalized, all right, pissed about the situation, extremely pissed, effing amateur hour, and heads should roll. They're angry. Uh, Pete Aguilar, you may know him from the fake illegally constituted January 6th select committee that wasn't following their own House rules, H.R. 503. He was the number three House Democrat, issued a rare rebuke of the White House, during a Punchbowl News segment, he said Biden's move was disappointing. Said, it's disappointing for me and anybody who believes in the home rule, honestly. I'm a former mayor of a city of 70,000, and I wouldn't want the federal government coming in and telling me what city ordinances to pass. So I think it's disappointing in that context, said Aguilar. Uh, no, but he wa- as a Democrat, he wants the federal government to mandate us into oblivion and tell us what to do. That's weird. Why, was, why when he was a mayor... Was it unacceptable? But now that he's a a House representative, it's uh, all appropriate. He says, I voted against it, but I understand and respect the president's position here. He says, we'll see. The Senate has to pass that. And I know that they've said that they have the votes, but all of those things have to happen. But it's disappointing for those of us who believe in home rule, right? The D.C. should govern itself. So an aide to a House Democrat who opposed the measure texted that the caucus, the Democratic caucus, is, quote, a little shocked by the move, right? They're like, what the heck? The crime bill passed in D.C. unanimously in January after D.C. Mayor Murray Muriel Bowser vetoed it. She said, this is crazy. You guys are like making carjackings allowable in our city. The city council overrode it. The city council overrode it 12 to 1. And so honestly, it's sort of like you got to kind of agree with the city council. Hey, man, yeah, I'm, I, I got to side with the local city council, man. If they want crime in their st- streets, let them have it. Mayor Bowser's trying to veto it. The president's trying to veto it. He's going to win. Or, or they wanted him to veto the, the thing, but he's not going to, and it's going to take the power back away from them. The bill would eliminate most mandatory sentences and lower penalties for a number of violent offenses, including carjackings and robberies. It would mostly expand the requirement for jury trials in most misdemeanor cases. Holy moly, you're kidding me. So as a defense attorney, that's like, uh, <laughs> that's like, uh, all right, that's pretty interesting. Jury trials in most misdemeanor cases. I mean, they're trying to do the opposite of that in most states. In Arizona, they're trying to speed up jury trials. In other states, they're trying to take away your right to a jury trial for most misdemeanors. Most misdemeanors, you don't have a right to a jury trial, right? In Arizona, you know, let's say you get uh, charged with an assault charge or something like that, right? And it's a misdemeanor low-level assault or even, you know, uh, there are other categories where you'd be surprised you, know, you, you get jury trials for like a DUI, but they're even trying to speed those up by removing your ability to strike certain jurors. So in, in, in other words, if they were going to expand this, that means that you're going to get a lot better plea deals because they're not going to they're not going to have the capacity to hire prosecutors to do more jury trials and more misdemeanor cases. And you're going to have a million defense attorneys who are saying, oh, perfect. Everything's a jury trial now. OK, yeah. Assault set it for a jury, set it for a jury. Sure. <laughs> Why not? Because, you know, you'll go and you just do it. And all you got to do is if you've got 50 cases, you just set them all for trial. And then you know, all the defense attorneys out of one particular prosecutor's office do that. And then they just get overwhelmed and burdened down. And so that would be a big change, right? You can, I can see why they vetoed this. Like this is an insane thing to do. But if the city council wanted it, man, let them govern themselves. In a tweet, Biden specifically mentioned the issue of carjackings. As of Thursday, there have been 94 carjackings in D.C. alone. One thing that the president believes is making the streets safer. Nevertheless, the Democrats are still upset. Today has been a sad day for D.C., said Eleanor Holmes, and our right to self-governance. Joe Manchin and others said that they're going to side with Republicans, said, I'm reviewing the actual provisions of the crime bill. And the president obviously said he's not going to veto it, which I think may weigh with my colleagues. So they're still debating it. Yeah, because if they pass these crime bills and crime gets worse, the Republicans are going to beat them 
politically with this stuff, right? They're going to say, yeah, look what they've done to their cities. They're weak on crime. So the Democrats are trying to pre-butt this. They don't want it to go that badly, right? But when they did it, man, the Democrats are unhappy. So he says, if the Senate votes to overturn what DC did, I'll sign it. He's agreeing with the Republicans and the Democrats are just angry. Here was one article over from Slate. We'll just take a quick look at it and move on. But you can see the language they're using. Why Biden stabbed DC in the back? Yikes. For the first two years of his presidency, see, he positioned himself as a supporter of the home rule, wanting to make DC the 51st state. But then on Thursday, he stabbed him in the back. In a single tweet, the president reversed more than two years of staunch support for home rule, abandoning his principles the moment they became politically expedient. Biden announced that he would sign legislation nullifying the D.C. code. His action will perversely, this person says, make the district less safe preserving an outdated 122-year-old criminal code whose ambiguities make it harder for prosecutors to charge violent crimes. I mean, this person is unhappy about it. And uh, that's Mark Joseph Stern over at Slate.com. That's just one article. And this sort of pattern was sort of repeated because a lot of this stuff is, you know, largely copy and paste. But this was another one, right, from Slate. Democrat rep turns on Biden. Absolute amateur hour. Heavy criticism. 173 Democrats supported it, and the Democrats are just unloading. So Joe Biden was asked about this today as he was uh, meandering his way down the halls of Congress. And uh, there was, let's see if there, there wasn't too much that we got out of him, but there was a journo, uh, a reporter who was there, Capitol Hill Trish, I believe is her name. And here is what she asked as he was walking through the halls. Mr. President, what do you plan to do on the D.C. crime bill? We understand you will not veto the effort to rescind it. Can you talk to us about that, sir? Will you please talk to us, sir? No. Oh, he's not talking. All right, so they're asking him about it. He's just walking on by. AOC was very unhappy about this as well. She says, look, Mr. President, this ain't it, all right? D.C., she said, has a right to govern itself like any other state or municipality. If the president supports D.C. statehood, he should govern like it. Plenty of places pass laws the president may disagree with. He should respect the people and the people's government of D.C. just as he does elsewhere, right? So she's very unhappy about it too. And there's going to be a lot more of this, I think, when this comes under uh, sort of, you know, next week once the full measure of this has been absorbed. We'll see what the other reaction looks like. But of course, you know, DC Mayor Muriel Bowser, she's this woman here. We've talked about her before several times. You may know her from other prior shows here where she rejected the National Guard on January 5th. There was an effort to bring in some support for the speech and for the protests that were going to be taking place. They sent a letter over there. Hey, do you need any any support? She said, absolutely not. Don't you send anybody over here. And she said, we're DC and we're going to govern ourselves. We don't want your troops here for in any way, shape or form. And then look what happened. Now they turn around and blame Trump for it. And MAGA Republicans who didn't do anything wrong. Point is, this is DC Mayor Muriel Bowser. And she's going to play this victim card pretty hard. These big government bureaucrats get very upset when a big government comes down and impedes on their local lifestyles. It's irritating, isn't it? Don't you hate when that happens? After a, a tough day for democracy in Washington, D.C. Uh, and it is a reminder to all of us that we are subject to the whims of the Congress until we become- You're telling me we are subject to the whims of Congress and your psycho party. The 51st state. I've said earlier that limited home rule is an indignity in itself. Uh, I learned while I was mayor, one thing that practical thing that I didn't know almost until the very moment that the then President Trump's chief of staff called us to tell us he wanted to take over our police department. But that's what the Home Rule Charter allows. We learned when our own ability to fund uh, Abortion care for these low-income DC residents has been blocked for years and years because of riders put on by the Congress. But that's what the Home Rule Charter allows. Uh, and today, uh, we also are reminded 
that the legislative process in the District of Columbia doesn't end when the council votes, or I sign a bill, or I veto a bill. It ends at the Congress and ultimately with the President of the United States. Right. That's the indignity of limited home rule. Right. There is but one way to change it, and Say that it. is to become the 51st state. They want it, man. They're gonna push for it hard. It would change the whole fabric of the whole country, right? You'd have another three electoral votes and you know that there are many elections that are just, you know, by the skin of it, your teeth there. So I am immensely proud of what we've done together as Democrats over the last eight years and decades before that to raise the issue of statehood. Of course, it's about our own representation and autonomy but it's also about how this nation becomes a more perfect union and has full representation of the values of the people of America in the Congress. And it's strange, you know, it feels like she is sort of overriding the will of the people in DC, right? City council represents the people of DC. She vetoed it. So she didn't like that. Now they're vetoing her veto. And so, I guess she's only happy if she has the power and she gets the way that, you know, she, in other words, she wants it her way. DC wants it their way. They want to win all the time. And if they don't win all the time, it's a bad deal. But that's not how adults operate. That's not how the real world works. So the White House has a lot to answer for. Now they are very upset at the congressional buildings where a bunch of hundred plus Democrats thought that they were going to get one thing from the white house and turns out they're not. So Corrine got asked a bunch of questions about this from members in the media. And one of them was a lot of fun. We'll save it for last, but she was basically fighting with Corrine. She's saying, I just, I can't understand this because you're saying that you support DC statehood and self-governance and autonomy, but you literally just strip that away from them like you're taking it away. So how do you reconcile those two? And I feel bad for her because she's as confused as we are. We'll get there in a quick minute, right after we talk about being ultra healthy from our friends, with help from our friends at Field of Greens, because we would all like to lose those leftover pandemic pounds, but how sick are you of all of the ads for weight loss pills and fad diets and all that stuff? I mean, you've been there, you've done that. We all know they don't work, but you know what does? eating five healthy servings of fruits and vegetables every day. You do that and the weight would probably just fall right off. But look, vegetables, not a fan. Who's got time to prepare all of that every day? Instead, think about Field of Greens. Now, Field of Greens is a science-backed formula of specific fruits and vegetables that you won't find in any other product. Proper nutrition reboots your metabolism so you burn calories faster and lose weight a healthier way. And Field of Greens is the only brand backed by a better health promise. Yes, you'll look and feel healthier fast, but the greater proof will come at the next checkup when your doctor sees you and he says, my goodness, you've lost weight. Whatever you're doing, keep it up. You'll know that you've been eating Field of Greens. Now, it's easy to get started and it's easy to do it by going over to fieldofgreens.com. When you go there and you fill up your cart with all sorts of good, healthy products, don't forget to use code Robert at checkout. Put Robert right in there and you're going to save 15% off at checkout and it's going to be a great decision. The vegetables want to be eating. You're going to be bursting with green energy and fieldofgreens.com is going to help you do it. So don't forget to use code Robert at checkout. All right, my friends. Now, the media has a lot of questions for the White House, backstabbed, blindsided, effing amateur hour and so on is being lobbied towards the Biden administration for sort of pulling the rug out on many of the Democrats who are supporting DC home rule. And Corrine has to deal with the consequences as usual. Let's see how she does. Good to see you. It's been a while. Thanks. You um, have the floor. Great. It is your 100th uh, press briefing. Oh my gosh. Oh. So I'm sure you're thrilled. <laughs> has it how been a hundred? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I need right. an ad bill. Cheers. Um, cheers. So, we're moving right along. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about the DC crime criminal code again. Um, we're, we've been hearing that some of the House Democrats feel like they got thrown under the bus a little bit. 
uh, by the president's decision not to step in on the um, effort to stop the overhaul, which is a lot of negatives, I understand. But I think you know where I'm going. Um, so I wanted to know, you know, did the president get them a heads up on the decision? Was there any sort of back and forth about it? Um, so first, let me just say that the White House notified um, the um, uh, notified the members at the House retreat, as you know, uh, back that was uh, earlier this week, or is still happening in Baltimore. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, I do want to lay out that uh, the president and the administration has a very close relationship uh, with House Democrats and Senate <laughs> Democrats as well. Uh, we have worked together. The president has worked very well uh, with the members on delivering bold, um, historic pieces of legislation in his first two years of an administration uh, and is very proud of the relationship that he has with them. And our teams are constantly in communication with them. Uh, and so I'll leave that there. This is a very strong, important relationship for all of us here, including the president. Uh, I, I also want to state that, look, the president supports D.C. statehood. That is something that okay, you good. saw in his SAP for this particular uh, D.C. crime bill. Uh, and uh, if Congress sends him a Now, the SAP is the special administrative procedure. It's like the document. It's like, hey, this is what we're going to do. Everybody be aware of this. You know, so that it's like a memo, I'd say bill making a DC state he'll always always be sure to sign it because he's been talk he's been talking about that for the last uh, two decades uh, but you know vetoing the bill headed to this his desk now won't make make DC uh, a state okay. and so those are the things okay but it would sort of be reflective of giving DC the autonomy to sort of act like a state right I mean they're not technically a state but you would still be giving them and granting them the ability to sort of, you know, self-actualize, manifest destiny. You know, they're going to do what we all want to do, which is to govern ourselves free of psychotic bureaucrats. So they could have afforded D.C. that. They didn't have to, to agree with the Republicans, right, Kareem? that the president is really has been very clear about uh, when it comes to D.C. and their statehood. And so I'll leave it there. But as it relates to the House, uh, as it relates to Senate Democrats, it is a very important relationship to, for us and, and clearly very important. And, and with the Senate uh, Democratic Caucus, as you know, when he met with them um, yesterday, mm -hmm. he provided uh, what he was going to do and made it very clear to them. And they had that discussion. Um, I just also want to ask, so, you know, Biden and the Democrats have talked a lot about the need to stem, you know, rising crime, but also the need to reform a criminal justice system that still disproportionately affects, you know, black Americans. So why not engage in some sort of compromise or why not let the DC bill, because, you know, the mayor mm -hmm. uh, vetoed the criminal code, but she also proposed some changes that she thought would have made the system sort of better on the whole. So just- It's a great question. You know. You talk a lot, also talk a lot about justice reform and criminal justice reform. You know, in addition to you believing as a general matter that D.C. should have blanket statehood and be able to govern themselves with some autonomy, you also say that criminal justice reform really needs some serious action. And here, D.C. was focused on this. We've got a city council who obviously knows their city better than Joe Biden does, and they are the people who are meeting with their constituencies, many of whom I'm sure are experiencing issues like this, which is why this issue is so important. It's working way it, its way up to the city council's level. And then they are making a decision and they voted 12 to one to pass this stuff. The mayor took it away from him. Biden took it away from him and Biden's joining with the Republicans to do it. So if they are literally trying to do both things and reform the justice system that impacts their citizenry, how can you possibly take that away? I want to be very clear here, and uh, if you look at the the DC bill itself, and I know that um, there was a little bit of, of I was asked a, a couple of questions of uh, what else does it do besides armed carjacking, and I don't normally go line by line on on legislation, especially legislation that we haven't introduced. But you're going to do it uh, now, aren't you? I did talk to the team, and we have a couple of things yeah. that I just want to lay out for all yeah. of you. Don't normally do it, but we. The DC bill does. We it have to do it on this one. So penalties, hold on a minute. Uh, for off offenses like murder. 
murders and other homicides, armed, armed home invasion burglaries, armed, armed carjackings, as I mentioned, armed robberies, unlawful gun possession, and some uh, sexual assault offenses. And so, look, the president has been very clear. We need to do more to reduce crime, to make communities uh, safer, to save lives. And that's why he put together, he put forth his Safer uh, America plan that does just that that we believe does exactly that. So the way that we see this bill, it doesn't actually reform policing practices. That's not something that it oh, does. Oh, it's a good reform answer. Reform like the ones the president has put forward at the federal level. You know about the executive order when uh, it couldn't be done on the uh, Senate side, making, doing, uh, moving forward with police reform. The president put forth a historic piece, uh, uh, a piece of an executive order to get to, to try to do what we can at the federal level. And so we believe that this bill does not actually Amazing. do that. Yeah, it's a good answer. I mean, it's a good answer. She takes a deep breath there because she knows it's all hogwash, but it is a good answer. She's sort of saying, oh, oh gosh. Oh, no, of course we do believe in justice reform and criminal and, and what's happening to uh, disadvantaged communities who are being disproportionately impacted by police brutality and all those things. And we definitely get it. And so we're not deviating from that. We're very consistent, in fact. However, this bill didn't really hit those checkboxes that we needed it to. And so the bill deviated from our standards. We didn't deviate from theirs, which is very, you know, it's a very nice way to dismantle a good question. It's also very condescending. It's saying to all of those 12 city council people who voted to pass it, you idiots. What do you think? This is a justice bill. You think this is going to reform our justice morons? Obviously, you're too dumb. You don't know what you're doing. And so we're going to take this decision away from you, idiots. Maybe you'll get it right next time. And if you do, then maybe we'll allow you to pass it. But if not, we'll just veto it again, or we'll just take it out of your hands regardless. So very, very curious that what's happening here. Now, there was another question from this woman. She says to Kareen, you know, look, you could have told them about this earlier. A lot of them are blindsided. Over 150 Democrats voted for you. They stood behind you. They had your back, Joe. Why, when it came time to make a decision on this, why now are you only deciding via Twitter to pull the rug out from under them? Thanks, Green. Uh, just following up on Colleen's question on the DC crime bill, uh, the House Democrats who are expressing anger and frustration, uh, they are in part saying that they wish they had known sooner what the president's position would be. As you know, a whole bunch of House Democrats already voted against the bill. Um, why didn't the White House make this position clear before that vote had taken place in the House? So, look, when we put out the SAP, um, uh, I think it was around the State of the Union, I think that's when the SAP came out. Um, we were Early very February. clear on where and what, where the president was, which is making sure that he continues his commitment to D.C. statehood. And that's what you saw uh, in, in that SAP, in that support for D.C. statehood. Okay. Uh, and at the time, you know, many times, many of, even earlier this week, many of you were asking me, I think your colleague was asking me uh, which direction the president was going to go. Uh, and he never made that clear in that SAP. And I think as it was becoming, yeah, that's the we, point. Always let, we always let the, yeah. the, uh, the process in Congress go through, right? Whatever mechanism they... Yeah, the, the point is that the SAP didn't say anything and they would have liked the SAP to say something so that they had some notice, right? take however it, it moves forward so we never we're always very clear and careful about that but as it now looks like it was going to come to his desk uh, we wanted to communicate where we were going to go oh, uh, after we everybody wanted to voted communicate on it. Uh, how the president was going to move forward uh, with hmm. um, uh, with this particular bill and we did and we uh, after we laid that out he we're explaining that now why he, yeah right that's he the is point moving forward in that way and the white house and congressional de democrats as we have known have come together on many different things to deliver for the american people and the president wants to continue to do so but i guess you know the president supports dc statehood he's been clear about that but he's not going to veto this bill from congress which does amount to congress sort of meddling in <coughs> dc's own <coughs> governance <coughs> right so how do you square that circle? Both things can't be true. They both can't no, be we true. believe uh, both things can be true. Wow. Look, right now, D.C. <laughs> is not a state. 
uh, this is coming to the president, okay. right? This is something that's coming to his desk, and he has to take action. I just laid out a moment ago to Colleen uh, why we felt that this bill doesn't actually deal with police reform. Uh, this president has been yeah, because someone the DC's too for stupid, many the years, many decades, who has too always put the out. safety of American, American families, uh, certainly across the country first. That's why he put together his Safer America plan uh, that lays out 100,000 cops in communities to work with communities to make sure that communities feel safe. The cops, uh, the cops plan, that is something that the president started as senator. It's something, it's actually a, a, a policy that Republicans want to not fund uh, and and take that away, take away, uh, uh, an, away an option uh, to make communities safe. So this is something that the president cares about uh, very strongly. Not that and much. And the way that we see it not DC is that this is coming to the president's desk. This is not a legislation that he put forward. D.C. is not yet a state, even though he supports D.C. statehood. And he had to make a decision. Okay, but supporting D.C. statehood is because you support D.C. making its own rules and governing itself. You can do that right now, right? You can you can be consistent in your principles, even though it's not a state. Uh, and uh, look, again, we let the process move forward in Congress, and we felt this was the time to to make that decision. All right, so bad timing. Uh, sorry, Democrats, you got hung out to dry. You were sort of a little bit of a bait and switch going on, right? You thought the president had your back and you were going to be fighting for this. And maybe you had another thing planned out where this would be the first step of a jumping, a stepping stone to making DC a, a 51 first state. Don't know. But we try again a third time. We're still trying to reconcile these two things. How can Biden support DC statehood while simultaneously doing things that strip DC of its self-governance and its autonomy? How can those two things be consistent with one another? It'll make your head explode, which is basically what it did to this person in the media as well. Thank you, Kareem. You mentioned the SAP that the administration put out on February 6th, but it's not a broad statement about D.C. statehood. No. It specifically says that the administration opposes the resolution that would dismantle the crime bill. So when was this policy reversed and why weren't House Democrats notified about the reversal? So from, I'll say this, um, there was never a change of heart on where we were um, with, uh, uh, with the SAP. The SAP, the way that it's laid out, speaks to um, the president supporting D.C. statehood. That is, what, that is where we were. Uh, that's what we were at the time, wanted to make sure that we, again, lifted up where the president has been for the past decades, making sure that uh, D.C., uh, you know, fighting for D.C. to become a state. And we actually say in the SAP that if, uh, you know, if, um, it, you know, if Congress wants to move forward in that way, we should pa pass H.R. 51, make, make D.C. the 51 state. And so we never laid out where we where the president was going to uh, was going to go, which was the uh, question that, we just heard. Once it came to his desk, because we Why wanted not? to allow uh, you let a bunch to of move forward in the way that they normally do with the mechanism when a when a piece of legislation moves forward. And so we never said anything at this time. Now we're communicating very clearly. Now that we know that this legislation is going to be in the president's. At, at, at the president's desk, uh, we're making very clear and communicating that where the president is is on this on this legislation. Wait, I'm sorry. It, it it specifically says the word opposes. So is it that the administration wasn't aware of the content, the specifics of the crime bill, and now you are aware? And the president says he doesn't support some of the changes that the D.C. Council put forward. Where is the disconnect? Because. When you released the SAP, um, I, I'm assuming, maybe incorrectly, that you were very aware of what the council was proposing. We were aware of what the council were, pos were proposing. What we're saying was that we wanted to make sure that we continued the president's, uh, the president's continued push for, uh, for statehood, and that's what we did. That's what we did in the SAP, and that was what was the most important thing that we believed. Um, there was no veto threat in the SAP. There really wasn't. We may have, it may have been, I just read it while you were asking me, that we didn't oppose, we opposed it, but there was no veto threat. Uh, so I want to be really clear about it. It stated our support for D.C. statehood, it, but it did not indicate what the president would do should the bill come to the desk. It did not say that. It did not lay 
that out. Now we're communicating that very clearly. We communicated uh, with the House Democrats days ago when they were in Baltimore. And uh, and again, I said this. Uh, I said this uh, to MJ. I remember many of you asking where we were going to go, and I said we don't have any. We don't have a decision yet. We don't have anything to share on this uh, on where the president's going to be with this particular bill. And now we are because we know that it's going to come to his desk. There must be some state laws that the president also disagrees with um, that have to do with crime. And he obviously doesn't have the power to do anything about that. I, I'm trying to square his decision Good luck. to use his power to do something in D.C. while he's also saying, you know, the federal government you know, shouldn't, should allow them to be their own state. Because yeah, D.C. is not a state. So, so th he this can, bill... And therefore he should? D.C. is not a state, so therefore the bill is coming to his desk, so he has to make a decision. It's as simple yeah. as that, Weijia, right? Because D.C. is not a state. Now, he wants D.C. to become a state. We've been very clear about that. He has said that for decades, that he believes in D.C. statehood, but it's not. A, it's not. And so therefore, because D.C. is not a state, when bills like this come uh, occur, it goes to the president. We know the process. He has to make a decision, and that's where we are. It's as simple as that. It's not that simple. Now, if DC Kareem. becomes a state, yes, the president he believes be that it should in be his governing. Principles. Our city should be governing uh, on its own. That's what he believes. But until then, they shouldn't. But DC, Weijia, DC is not a state. Right, but I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm asking because he does have an option to veto. That is one action right. he could take. But again, this is a president that believes in keeping communities safe. He believes in keeping the 700,000 residents in D.C. safe. And so he's taking that action because it's coming to him. We didn't put this legislation to get forth. This is not our legislation. This is a, a legislation that is coming before the president of the United States because D.C. is not a state. It's just not. So he has to make a decision. So he's going to make a decision that will uh, that will help the residents of D.C., that will deliver for the residents of D.C. And it's as simple as that. Thank okay. you. I'm seeing two. All right. So that thank you for the, uh, the excellent meme, our friend. That was John McGarvey in the house. Thank you, John. Yes, the stream instantly got better when we were able to deviate our mind off of Kareem. So that's what they're talking about over there. Kareem Jean-Pierre trying to paper over some of the mistakes that the Biden administration maybe has done. Democrats calling it a major betrayal, saying he stabbed him in the back. They got blindsided and that this is amateur hour effing, effing, a effing, effing. That's how upset they are. So we, of course, will continue to cover it. Thank you for liking this video wherever it is you're watching it. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one.